15. It reads, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that also hear thee. Well, that is one of our students, Britton Bidiger, and he's another student from the state of Michigan. We've got several students from the state of Michigan, and we're glad to have them along with all of these students. I have thus far during the month of July introduced to you a number of our new students by having them uh, present the scripture reading at the beginning of the sermon. And I'm glad to introduce to you Britton this morning. Uh, this past Wednesday night, we welcomed into our church family Lee and Katie Frederick, along with their children, uh, Cole and Hannah. The thing is, whenever you're introduced on Wednesday night, you get to stand again on Sunday morning. Would you stand again? This is a wonderful family who've moved here from Jackson, Mississippi. We're glad to have you, brother and sister Frederick and Cole and Hannah as well. And uh, they join uh, brother and sister Reed, who placed membership with us last Sunday. And I'm also pleased this morning to introduce to you another wonderful Christian couple, uh, Tom and Johnny Ann Waycaster. I have been acquainted, I have known Brother Tom Waycaster for a long time. I've always appreciated his preaching. I've always appreciated the articles, manuscripts that he has written. He has uh, likewise uh, uh, written commentaries on uh, books of the Bible. And Brother Waycaster is a new addition to our Memphis School of Preaching faculty. And he has arrived along with his wife to join us in this work. And this morning, Brother and Sister Waycaster want to identify themselves with us at the Forest Hill Congregation. So Brother and Sister Waycaster, would you stand right where you are so we can recognize Brother and Sister Waycaster this morning. Thank you so much. We're so glad to have you. I want you to get to know all these good people. And uh, I know these students are going to enjoy uh, studying under Brother Waycaster, but likewise, if things go as they usually do, you'll have that opportunity because I'm sure from time to time, Brother Waycaster will be teaching some uh, adult classes uh, here at the congregation. And I've already said, uh, sometime I want you to preach. And he'll probably preach on several occasions in the coming months. And so I know you're going to enjoy hearing from him. Sincerity is something that we appreciate in people. I mean, we'd rather be with people who are genuine and real than those who are not. And yet we readily recognize that some people can be sincere, but sincerely wrong about some things. You just proved that a minute ago, right? After we sang the first song, you wanted to sit down, didn't you, right? Mm-hmm. I've seen that before. Instead of following the song leader and doing all things decently and in order, we think, well, you're supposed to sit down after the first song. And so everybody sincerely sits down. But you don't sit down unless the song leader says sit down. You don't sit down when you're singing a medley of songs, of praise songs. You keep standing till he says be seated. But we're sincere about it, right? But we can be sincerely wrong. Now that's... That's something that's rather humorous. That's not going to be very harmful. But I'll tell you, some people are going to find themselves on the day of judgment unprepared to meet their God because, though sincere, they were wrong about some very, very important doctrinal matters. The title of the message this morning, Why Doctrine Matters. It seems that particularly in the day and age in which we're living, there are many people who have sold out doctrine for sincerity. 
Uh, that as long as someone is sincere about what he believes, that's really all that matters. Particularly that's true in the realm of religion, isn't it? People just think, well, this person is sincere. What does it really matter what he or she believes? We shouldn't really be amazed anymore, and yet I do find that it's later than we think, perhaps. I just read the other day where the Church of England, uh, the Church of England is now looking into transgenderism and seeing how they might can harmonize that with biblical teaching. That, of course, is the Episcopal Church here in the United States. Long has been on the left uh, of religious matters, uh, far to the left, radically to the left, in approving things that God's Word uh, says is contrary to His will. And so uh, I'm finding the older I get, the more I understand uh, generations before who would sometimes say, uh, you better watch out because one thing can lead to another. <laughs> and that's certainly true in the realm of religion. On the other hand, there, there is that person who, who is... Um, uh, very religious, uh, very sincere about his or her religion, who believes in God and believes in Jesus and, and uh, lives an upright life. And yet this person doctrinally we know uh, is not doing things that are in harmony with the Bible. The worship, the church of which she's a member. Uh, there are many things that she has believed religiously that we know aren't in harmony with the Bible. Yet it bothers us, doesn't it, because the person is so sincere and in many ways seems so close to being right, even in doctrinal matters, but still problems. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll look at that person and we will say, how can such a person be lost? A believer in God believes that Jesus Christ is God's Son, believes that Jesus died on the cross for sins. He, he goes to a church. He, he, he likes everybody, and, and, and he's a good, upright person. How could, how could such an individual be, be lost? And so I think it is pertinent to ask the question sometimes, does, does doctrine matter? Does it really matter what we believe or, or is, is sincerity all that matters? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, in this passage that Britain read just a moment ago, uh, Paul tells us how important it is to take heed to, to doctrine. And so to the young man Timothy, he writes, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Now, take heed unto thyself means that, that this man Timothy better be sincere in what he believes, right? Take heed unto thyself. Know who you are. And likewise, know what you believe, and it better be right. Because he says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. When you take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine, then you'll save yourself. And also you will save others that you instruct them that hear thee. It's not the only time that Paul emphasizes in this first epistle to Timothy the importance of sound doctrine. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, Paul says, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Likewise, we find in 1 Timothy 4 6, Paul says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 3, notice this passage. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Now, this word doctrine, it's important that we know what that means. 
Doctrine has to do with teaching, doesn't it? All that God has given us is doctrine or teaching. We are instructed in the way of the Lord because we've paid attention to Bible doctrine, Bible teaching. When we speak of sound doctrine, we are talking about that which is healthy or wholesome. It's good for us. There could be unsound doctrine. We sometimes refer to unsound doctrine as error. This is error or this is erroneous. It's not in harmony with the Bible. We are to be in love with sound doctrine or sound teaching. It's wholesome. It's healthy. It's good for us. If you're eating healthy foods or wholesome foods, that's good for you. Spiritually speaking, we partake of the Word of God, and that's good, sound, wholesome, healthy doctrine. So does doctrine matter? We come in contact with a lot of sincere religious people today who seemingly pay very little attention to doctrine. But having just presented to you several scriptures from 1 Timothy that relate to doctrine, I want you to consider some words of our Lord. And think about this. If doctrine is not important, why then in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount, did he make this bold, sobering statement? Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, if all that matters is, is that a person be sincere, then Jesus surely wouldn't have made that statement, right? According to the statement made by Jesus, doctrine really is important. Stay in the Gospel of Matthew and go over to chapter 15 and look at verse 9 where Jesus says that some worship Him in a way that He calls vain or empty. And he says, in vain they do worship me. They are teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And here's a passage. I heard it a lot when I was a child. And we need to emphasize it even today. It's two verses later. Or rather in verse 13, excuse me. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. There is going to come a day when all that is that is fault is going to be rooted up. When that which is man-made will be rooted up, every plant which my Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. That is everything that is not in, that is not in harmony with sound doctrine, isn't it? And then in John 12, 48, Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So here we find that we're going to be judged by the words of Christ, and his word is doctrine, isn't it? It is his teaching. So doctrine indeed matters. Furthermore, our Lord Jesus Christ made this claim in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And as was just discussed in our previous Wednesday evening class by Brother South, if indeed Jesus is the Savior, and we know that He is, then we need to hear Him. So we've established that Paul spends a lot of time talking about doctrine. And our Lord teaches how dangerous it is to set aside sound doctrine. But as we consider this morning the subject why doctrine matters. I want us to go into the book of Acts and notice three specific examples as to how we know that doctrine really does matter. I want to first of all introduce to you a man that we know as the Apostle Paul, a beloved figure to each one of us. But before he was ever the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, correct? 
And we first are introduced to him in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. Stephen is the hero of Acts 7, boldly preaching the gospel. And then he's stoned to death. And this Saul of Tarsus is there giving his approval to the stoning of this righteous man, Stephen. Now, Stephen preached that which was sound doctrine, didn't he? Stephen preached that which was in harmony with the will of God. Saul of Tarsus, on the other hand, was in opposition to that. Was Saul of Tarsus doing this because he was a man that was, that was overwhelmed with evil? Was Saul of Tarsus doing this because he was anti-God? Not in his mind. Saul of Tarsus was doing this because he thought persecuting Christians was right in the sight of the Almighty. I'm telling you, this Saul of Tarsus could not have been more sincere in what he was, what he was doing. Carrying out a type of jihad against Christians, that's what he was doing. But he thought it was, was right. On two different occasions in the book of Acts, Saul, uh, Paul rather, the apostle, will give us an idea of why he did what he did. In one passage, he says that he thought he ought to do many things that were contrary to the name of Jesus. Acts 26, 9. That's before King Agrippa. And likewise, in Acts 23, 1, he said up to, uh, up to that particular time when he was speaking, he had lived in good conscience before God. Now, does God want us to have a, a good conscience? Yes. Does he want our conscience to be, to be clean and clear? Sure. But Saul of Tarsus thought what he was doing was right. He likewise thought that what he was doing was pleasing to God. It gave him a soothed conscience, and he was very sincere in what he was doing. And yet he was sincerely wrong. Why? Because doctrine matters. That's why. And his doctrine was not right. Here is a man who, who had a religious pedigree at that particular time that was second to none. Just read Philippians 3 and notice what Paul says about himself before he became a Christian. He really is in his, in his uh, uh, days before his conversion a representative of all of those who are part of the world's religions that are anti-Christ. He really is. He was sincere, but he was wrong. And he was wrong because doctrine matters. Here's another example. He's found in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. His name is Cornelius. It's going to be very difficult to find how a man like Cornelius could have been lost. But notice in verse 1, there was this certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion. He's a soldier. He's of the band called the Italian band. He's from Italy. And the text says he is a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Here is an upright, sincere, moral man. Surely he's right with God. But Cornelius is an example of one who can be a sincere, morally upright man, still be lost, isn't he? Here is a man the text says was devout. Does that speak to his sincerity? Yes. He really, he really was a sincere, a genuine human being. He even acknowledged there's a God in heaven. And I want to do what God says. He feared God. And if you looked at his household, you said, what a good family is the house of Cornelius. He gave a lot of alms to the people. He was a very generous man. He was a philanthropist, you could say. He was a man evidently of means because he gave much alms to poor people. And oh, how we lift up people in our society who help those who are weak and frail and poor. And such ought to be acknowledged. He likewise was one who prayed. Is it true that, that good moral people outside of Jesus still pray? Oh, they do. They do indeed. One of my favorite all-time television shows, it's a classic, The Waltons from the 1970s. 
Do you remember how Olivia Walton, Grandpa, Grandma, the whole family would go to church on Sunday, but John Walton did not go? John said he just couldn't understand why it was important to go to church. He didn't understand why it was necessary for him to be dunked in water, as he called it. He says, I believe in God. And he was a man who obviously was a good man. He cared about his neighbor. He helped other people. And I've seen John Walton sit with his family on a Sunday and offer thanks for the meal, even though he didn't go to church. So he believed in God and prayed. Good moral man. But good moral people will be lost. Why? Not because they're lacking in sincerity. They're very sincere. But because doctrine matters. All right? So we've looked at this man named Saul of Tarsus, who we know later became the Apostle Paul. We've looked at Cornelius, this centurion, who was a good, decent, moral man, but who needed something more. And then we come over to Acts chapter 18, and this is just going to be amazing what we read about this man. His name is Apollos, verse 24. He is a Jew. He was born at Alexandria. I want you to listen to what the text says about him. He was an eloquent man. That is, if you're going to hear some public speaker, you wouldn't mind hearing Apollos, right? He was an eloquent man. He was a great public speaker. Not only that, he knew a lot of Scripture, mighty in the Scriptures. He knew a lot of Bible. He stood before large audiences and preached. That's what Apollos did. But the text says this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. He's talking about Jesus when he stands up and preaches. He is teaching a lot of good things. He has the ear of a lot of sincere people, and he's a sincere preacher. But the text says he knows only the baptism of John. That's all that he knows. Now, he's an eloquent man. He's a sincere man. He is a knowledgeable man. He is a zealous man. He's telling others what he knows. But something's missing. And it's very important. And verse 26 tells us that he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him what? The way of God more perfectly. He needed to get his doctrine right. He knew a lot about Jesus. He knew something about baptism. He knew something about, uh, about uh, a Christ that he thought was to come. But the problem is Christ had already come. And therefore he was teaching error, even though he was teaching a lot of truth. And therefore this godly couple, Priscilla and Aquila, took him aside and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And then the text says, When he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now what do we learn? He got his doctrine right, didn't he? He got his doctrine right. But here is a man, Apollos, as long as he was teaching the doctrine of John's baptism, as if that was still in effect, he was teaching error, wasn't he? He was teaching something that was not in harmony with the will of God. He needed to be corrected. Despite his sincerity, you see, doctrine really did matter. I want to tell you, there are a lot of people who would no doubt have been confounded, amazed, and even upset if you'd said, this man of Paulus, he'd lost. But he was because he was neglecting to teach Bible doctrine. So, we find three individuals here, all sincere, devout individuals. Saul of Tarsus, Cornelius, Apollos, all three sincere, but all three lost. And why? Because doctrine matters. But I want us to see something very special about these three men. And this is what is missing in so many today. These men were teachable. They allowed themselves to be corrected. 
You remember with this one Saul of Tarsus, the Lord Jesus Christ who knew the heart of the apostle uh, of, of Saul of Tarsus, who would become the apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. And he asks an interesting question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now, Saul of Tarsus really wouldn't have thought what he was doing was a persecution of Christ. He was persecuting these Christians. He was persecuting the church of Christ. And Jesus makes it clear when you persecute the church of Christ, you're persecuting him. And so Saul of Tarsus, what would you have me to do? And so Jesus says, you go into the city and it will be told thee what thou must do. Now the rest of the conversion story we can read in other passages. For example, in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, Ananias says to Saul of Tarsus, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now what's happening? He's being baptized in harmony with biblical doctrine. Now he's going to start teaching and preaching Bible doctrine. Oh, but he was sincere before that, sincerely lost. Why? Because doctrine matters. What about this man named Cornelius? Well, Cornelius was this devout man, one who prayed, one who feared God, gave a lot of alms to the people. But he needed to hear from a gospel preacher, didn't he? Because there was something else he needed. He needed the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. He needed some sound teaching. That's what he needed. And Peter would come to, to Cornelius and teach him the truth of the gospel. And then verse 48, rather verse 47 of chapter 10, Peter says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? So once Peter preached to them and they got their doctrine right, what happened? Then this man Cornelius was saved, but not until then. Sincere, but sincerely lost because doctrine matters. Now what about this one named Apollos? Let's look at Acts chapter 18 and notice what happened again with Apollos. Apollos was teaching only the baptism of John. All right? The baptism of John was all about what? Believing in the Jesus that is to come. Repent, be baptized, and look to Jesus who is to come. But by the time Apollos was preaching, Jesus already come. And uh, this is the New Testament era. And Pentecost has already passed. And here is Apollos teaching something different. He needs to learn the way more perfectly. He needs to learn the truth, doesn't he? What happened then? Well, even though he had been baptized in accordance with the baptism of John and was teaching others to be baptized in accordance with the teaching of John, that baptism was effective, was not effective. You see, it really is true. You can't believe wrong and be baptized right. You just can't. So we look at chapter 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what were you baptized? They said, Under John's baptism. So what Paul said, well, that's good enough. Y'all come ahead and, no, no, that's not what he said. It's what a lot of people might say. Oh, I've, I have been studying with individuals before from other religious groups, and, and they come to realize, yes, indeed, one must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of past sins, confess Jesus, and be baptized for the mission of their sins. I believe it now. You ready to be baptized? Oh, I already was baptized somewhere else in this other religious group. Oh, you need baptized again. Well, Why? Because you can't believe wrong and be baptized right. Notice what happened here. Paul says, unto what then were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him whom, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, what happened? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized correctly. You see, now they have a proper understanding of what baptism is all about. And we obey from the heart that form of doctrine that's been delivered unto us. 
And so sure, they were sincere before that, but sincerely wrong and therefore lost. Why? Because doctrine matters. That's why. And I present this sermon this morning to you because of the age in which we're living where sincerity seems more important than doctrine. Just as long as people are sincere, then everything will be okay. The Bible doesn't teach that. We are to search the Holy Scriptures. We're to study God's truth. We are to come to a knowledge of what God would have us to do and understand biblical doctrine. I'll tell you, these three men, you got to say this about them, be it Saul of Tarsus, Cornelius, or Apollos, each one of them had two characteristics that if a man doesn't have, can't become a Christian. All three were honest. All three were honest. And all three were humble. When you have people who are honest and you have people who are humble, you'll have people becoming New Testament Christians. They will want to make sure the doctrine is right. And that's why Jesus, as he, as he begins the Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's for no one else but for those who are poor in spirit. James would write, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. How do you receive it? The only way you can, with meekness. Sincerely, yes, but honestly and humbly. That's a message I believe our world really does need to hear today. To get right with God demands sincerity but not sincerity alone. It also demands that we get the doctrine right. And the doctrine is found right here in God's holy word. You ready to obey the gospel this morning? You can do it. You can do that which is in harmony with the will of God. I didn't ask you if you were a good moral person. I didn't ask you if you believe some of the Bible I didn't ask you if you've been baptized at some point in your life. I'm asking you, have you as a penitent believer confessed Jesus and been baptized for the remission of your sins? Wherefore, he can add you to the church, the body of the saved. That's what you need to do if you've not already done that. And I may be speaking to someone this morning who is a child of God, but you have not been honest with yourself and therefore not honest with God. Maybe it's time to make some things right. You determine that. You know what it is. God knows. Respond accordingly as together we stand and sing.